I'm Benjamin Hall, and I'm Searching for Heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us again this week. And, um, you know, our guests this week are really interesting to me because they're a couple who just did not see what was coming. And it hit them really hard. Um, they are uh, Jennifer and Mike Leverell. And in 2019, Mike got sepsis from eating an oyster. He was in a coma. And when he came out, uh, he lost his lower legs and his fingers. But he survived. And it was as if almost overnight, this family went from being just a totally normal, healthy, happy family with two teenage kids to having to deal with a totally new life without limbs, without fingers. But what is so amazing about them, and I know that you'll hear that in this interview, is just this incredible resilience and strength. And it's not a over the top, you know, we're going to go get through anything. It is just this real stoicism that Mike seems to have. And I just think it's a fascinating story. And I think it's a perfect example of how family comes together when bad things happen. But um, here they are. And once again, thank you so much uh, for joining us this week. Mike, first of all, look, thanks so much for coming on the podcast with me. Like, I really appreciate that. And I want to soon get to, you know, what happened to you and the step by step and what it was like. But, you know, the point of this podcast is to really look also at, at resilience and mm -hmm. how people can get through things that are really difficult. And I read your story and I know that within a year of your injuries and what happened to you, you were coaching soccer again. You were back at work and everything talks about this incredible resilience that you found. And before I get into details, I just got to ask where that came from. But why do you have that? How, how, where is it from? I, I don't really know. Um, I, I would say that, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of stoicism, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, uh, I remember when I was in the hospital thinking about, you know, getting through everything. Um, you know, one quote came to my mind and it was, you know, um, the quote from Invictus and that stoic quote from Invictus. Um, I can't remember who the author was, but, uh, you know, I, I think it was about, uh, if I remember right, um, I believe Churchill used the same. Yes. Uh, is, is it about the limitless in us? Yeah. Yeah. It's about that. You know, um, I am the master of my fate. Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing, but also the support of my family and all my friends. I mean, I just had so much support, but, um, and they were really, um, really supportive and that, that got me through it too. But I was always thinking to myself, you know, I, I have two choices, right? Give up or keep marching on. So that was, that's the approach I like to take. And, and uh, also just... I, I, throughout, throughout, throughout life, you know, I've, I've had, uh, you know, a rare um, disease uh, that predate all this. It's, uh, it's called ankylosing spinalitis. So I was suffering from that, which required surgeries and, and that sort of thing in the past. So maybe that was part of it as well. I, I was used to it. I was, I was ready for it. Yeah, it's interesting whether or not experience can give you more resilience or prepare you for something that is worse. Um, I, I certainly believe that ex childhood can, that your life experiences can. I know that you've lived all around the world. And so perhaps all of those things you know, led to led to your ability to get through that. And Jennifer, I know you, you've just joined us as well. And I gotta say, Jennifer, I wasn't certain that you were going to join us when I didn't see you on at first, but um, I'm so grateful that you can, because this is all about family and teamwork and you get through these things together. And I know that you've been such a key part of this whole story. So thank you. For, uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for your kindness in responding to my email immediately. No, I was like, I was just, just saying to Mike, you know, it was, uh, I read that straight away and I thought, wow, like what an incredible story, not just of something that very few people know anything about, you know, and I think that's key today is to try and talk also just remind people. And I think you have said it before that you know, never put aside that feeling. If it's the worst feeling you've ever had, don't just write it off as the flu or something, go and get it checked out. Um, 
And so no, I'm just grateful that you guys, you guys are on. So thank you. Um, why don't we go back and talk about what happened first of all, and then we'll talk about how you guys got through it. So I don't know if Mike or Jennifer, you want to lead the way and talk about, I guess it was a Saturday night. You were out with friends, totally normal Saturday night and explain the next couple of days uh, to me then. So I started feeling ill. Like I had a stomach virus. I thought I had a stomach virus and I was achy all over. And, um, you know, it really kind of started, um, that Saturday, uh, that Sunday night. And then Monday morning, you know, kept on, it, it kept on going. Right. And, uh, I started feeling worse and then I, I got hydrated. I, I remember we went to the, uh, the CVS to get some Pedialyte because they were saying, yeah, you need to hydrate. You've lost a lot of, could be the stomach virus or something. And so I, I continued to, uh, you know, hydrate. I started feeling a little bit better. And then, uh, you know, well, sun, was it, uh, Tuesday evening? Well, during the day on Tuesday, I started feeling poorly again. And, and this was April 2nd, um, 2019. And then towards the evening, I started deteriorating and I was, I wanted to ask for some water from Jennifer because I, I, I was feeling very, very uh, dehydrated, even more dehydrated. And I couldn't even say the word water. Mm-hmm. And she became very alarmed at that point. So, and so it was that the point, Jennifer, at which you, yeah, was that the point that you realized there was something more significant going on than just a stomach bug? And, and how did you react? I remember distinctly his eyes looking at me and that I could tell he was trying to say something to me, couldn't say it. And that was when he knew something was wrong. I said, get in the car. We're going to go to the emergency room. And he tried, made it a few steps and then couldn't go further back to bed. And I called 911 and they came very quickly. And they told me later that if Mike had been able to get into the car and I had taken him to the hospital closest to our house, which is what I would have done, that he wouldn't have survived because that hospital doesn't have a trauma care center. The ambulance took him to a trauma care center, which is apparently where he needed to be. So that was, was quite, good. that was quite amazing that they, that they knew that was the right place to go because I, I mean, I, they already knew that it was something more. And I suppose that's the training. And we've got to remind people that, you know, you know, one little moment, just noticing one little different, you know, uh, about something can change the way it turns out. So I guess hats off to, to them as well. And was it as soon as you got there, when did you, when did you know that, but what was the diagnosis initially when you got to the hospital? There was no diagnosis, diagnosis initially. I waited. Um, I didn't know what was going on. Um, They eventually put him up into the ICU from the emergency room. And maybe one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, a doctor came in and started asking me questions and saying what they were going to be checking for encephalitis, I think she mentioned. But they just told me to go home and come back the next day and we would figure it out. So even then, I didn't realize how how bad it was, how serious it was. That's right. You were thinking about how to get the kids to, uh, how to get into the, to soccer the next day. So you, you didn't realize at that point, you thought it was just going to be in and out. I didn't realize. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so how did then, um, when, when did you realize that there was something more serious going on? I think the moment that they told me that they, they had done everything they could for him, He's suffering from some kind of infection, fungal, bacterial, viral. We don't know what, but based on, you know, what was going on with his body, they had him on maximum life support and they had done all they could. So that was the point where they told me that um, we wait now and Mm -hmm. we see what happens. They decided to scan his abdomen uh, just to see if there was anything unusual going on 
in his abdomen and they discovered that his gallbladder was inflamed. Uh, they had told me if they found anything that suggested the need for surgery, that that would be it because he wouldn't survive surgery. Based on what they saw with his gallbladder, they decided to drain his gallbladder just sort of on a hunch. Let's see if this does something. So they, he was in a medically induced coma. They lifted him up and flipped him over and uh, punctured his gallbladder and drained a bunch of gunk out of his gallbladder. This was, I think, maybe April 4th. And then we waited. Hmm. We waited to see if he would make some kind of turnaround or take a turn for the worse. Okay. Having been told that that it was unlikely he'd make it through, had you started to prepare yourself for his death? Uh, I didn't know what to tell my kids. Hmm. I think maybe to the extent I was preparing, it was trying to prepare what to tell them. Uh, Mike's friend Kent had flown in from California on April 3rd. And Mike's friend Dave was with us at the hospital. Kent got the social worker for me and, and Dave sat with me while the social worker gave me some advice about how to talk to our boys. So I think Jack was 16 at the time. And Nick was twelve, uh, so I, I did. What do they? What do they say? Like, I can't think of any advice that you would, that you would think of to to, to tell that message to your children. Yeah, uh, I wanted to find the right message that was wasn't quite. Your father might die, so you need to come see him. And hey, would you like to come and sit with Dad? And. Yeah be with dad. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because my wife, when I was injured in Ukraine, she spent a few weeks before telling them exactly the injuries I had because didn't, A, how do you convey that when you don't know what's going to happen? Where do you begin? Um, my kids were younger at the time, but I remember that also just being one of the hardest things for my wife. At, at what point do you tell them that dad might not be coming home? And um, uh so I've always, always known that was one of the difficult things uh, for her. Um, but so when did you finally know then that Mike, what was the turning point where you knew Mike was going to survive uh, and what happened from there? It wasn't that we knew he would survive. It was that he didn't die. Yeah. And so he was in a coma. He was placed in a coma April 2nd. And he finally emerged from the coma on April 14th, I think. Uh, so the question we had all that time, well, it's good news he hasn't passed away. He's still here. But is his brain still functioning? Nobody could tell us. When, you, when he wakes up, we'll know. And I'll never forget the morning going into the ICU. I was going in every day, of course. And his mom was here on the 14th. I'll never forget walking into his room and seeing the eyes looking at me. And I knew that his brain was okay. I could just tell. Wow. Wow. Um, and I know, Mike, just before you woke up, my writing saying you had a dream. So you coming back, you coming out of your coma was sort of, I suppose, well, t tell us about that. It was quite an event for you as well. Yeah, it was interesting because um, I, 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 I was having this long running dream where, um, and I was, I was thinking about myself when I was having the dreams, like, boy, this is a really long dream, <laughs> or is it a dream? And then, I, um, then in that dream, I was, I guess I was a spy of some sort. I don't know why, um, but that, you know, I, I, there was all these events transpiring and there was something involved with being in, in, um, at a post in Africa and, and some sort of conspiracy going, I don't know why you probably read too many books like that, but anyway, I, I, uh, I, I, I woke up and, you know, during my dream, there, there were there was chases going on. There was, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, stuff like that. And I woke up in a dark room and I was and it was a, it was a hospital. I realized it was it was a hospital. I had no idea how I got there. And the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, they got me. 
They got me, and that's why I'm in the hospital. The, you know, the, the nefarious forces that were chasing me somehow managed to get me, and that's why I was in the hospital. So I, 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 that was when I first woke up in, in the darkness, and nobody was, was there. And then I think at one point the, the nurse came in, and, and uh, the nurse on call there came in and said, um, hey, you know, see your back. Uh, and it was really great. But um, it wasn't, I think, until later that I saw Jennifer. But during that first wake up, it was at night. Did you and just I, say, were you asking? Presumably the first question is, what, what, where am I? What am I doing here? You know, what's the latest? I would definitely have done that. But I had a tube down my throat yeah. and I couldn't speak. And on top of that, I couldn't even wave my arms. They, they, were, they were really heavy and they had some some blackness on them of some sort i'm not sure what i think it might have been some of the results of the vasosuppressors or whatever but hmm. wasn't able to lift my arms either so it was it that's, was quite a shock actually when i, I was going to say you said shock i was going to say incredibly scary i mean yes. a lot of fear there yes uh, absolutely incredible amount of fear yeah, yeah. um and so yeah, like presumably jennifer you came to see him the next day but then you knew that the next phase was perhaps beginning, that he was alive, but that there was a lot, you know, a, a lot to come after that. When did you learn that you know, the, 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 his legs would have to be amputated? We, I don't know that it ever became apparent. And maybe I was in denial, but his limbs were turning purple. His extremities were turning purple due to the drugs that they had to put him on uh, to make sure that they maintain blood flow to his abdomen. And they put him on vasopressors. So those suppress the flow of blood to your extremities so that the blood will go to your, your vital organs. So there was a struggle to get him off those drugs and they had to keep putting him back on. And all the while we're watching the fingers turn purple and then black and the feet turned purple and then black. There just came a point where the left leg, the left foot had to come off. And I um, can't remember exactly what went into that, but we didn't know that amputation of the right leg was inevitable in the fingers. It just kind of rolled forward over time. What, what, what were the conversations between the two of you? Uh, you know, when yeah, presumably the doctors would say with well, the first one, the left leg will have to come off and then, you know, the, the, the right as well. But what were the conversations between the two of you? W were you being obviously very open with each other and saying, OK, this is going to happen, but it's going to be fine. You know, what, what, we will get through this. Like, were, there, were you sort of, where, again, get back to the idea of resilience. You know, what were the messages between yourselves at that point to say, hey, we can do this together. We'll, doesn't matter what they throw at us. We'll get through it. I think there was never any question for my part. We were going to go through it and get through it. There were a lot of questions around, you know, would Mike be able to come back to our house? Would we have to rent an apartment for a while? Would we have to renovate? How much was the hospital bill going to be? Would we have to sell our house? So I was just focused on one day at a time and what was immediately in front of me and not paying attention to any of that other stuff. But I, there was never any question that we were just going to keep going through this until yeah. we're ended. I mean, Mike must have been hard because the guy felt something similar knowing that I was coming home and I was afraid always of the extra weight and burden that I would put on my own wife because of, you know, the injuries that I was suffered. And I wondered if that ever crossed your mind at that point. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I was, it was top of my mind as I was, you know, as I, first of all, as I was in this hospital and I mean, the initial, when I woke out of the coma, I was, I was, I was helpless, right? I could, you know, I was on a breathing tube. I couldn't even roll. I mean, it was, there was, and, and I'm, that was starting to, you know, be prevalent in my mind was what kind of burden am I going to be? I can't do anything. And then it moved, you know, and even as it continued, um, you know, I kept thinking to myself that, uh, you know, my life has changed and I'm going to have to figure out a new way. Yeah. Um, 
Now, I, I know that I know that feeling very well. And in fact, I found that being in the ICU, you know, and I was in hospital for you know about six months or so, that felt like a battle. But I didn't realize that actually at that point I was surrounded by doctors and physios and I had people. I didn't realize the next battle when you go home. And that was almost harder for me than the hospital part. Um, and I don't know if you found that suddenly you got home and not only was it a different life and, you know, I, w we had to move house as well. Like I couldn't climb up and down all the stairs we had. We had to move house, but I had to think ahead to what life would look like. And do you feel like how different of a person do you feel? At one point, did you sort of say, I am a new person. People see me differently. This is who I am and this is. A, a new me or did you say i'm fine like, i'm the old me still i can keep moving like, how did you judge your own personality at that point i guess i said to myself you know yeah things have changed you know i don't have any legs i don't have any fingers i'm probably gonna have a kidney problem in the near future but um i thought to myself okay so so stop moaning stop you know think about let's go forward right let's go forward keep on marching because that was uh, I just had to adapt. I mean, I knew I was going to be different physically, but in my mind, I was the same same person, and I just needed to, yeah, circumstances changed. Uh, I just needed to adapt and, and move on. Yeah. Did you set yourself goals? Um, was that something that you were always doing? If uh, tomorrow I'm going to do this, oh, yeah. I'm going to do this much further. Did, did you find that that helped a lot? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I tried to always beat the goals. I remember once... Uh, mm. I was like, well, I'm going to be walking on the, you know, I got my new uh, prosthetics. I'm, I'm going on the, the walker. And my goal was I, I'm going to make it to, you know, the all the way through the house on the, on the walker. That was my goal. And then I was like, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm going to blow past that goal. I'm going to not use the walker. And so I was always kind of challenging myself to, to work harder. And, and yeah. Get closer. I think you've got to, to be honest. Um, yeah. I was always amazed in hospital to find that there were half the people, roughly half, wanted to do that. And half of them absolutely were going to do more and push themselves. And the other half just didn't. And I'm so fascinated. You know, other people lost their identity. They lost who they were. They lost their drive. And I honestly think that most of that comes down to those who are totally surrounded by community and family and incredibly positive things to help them go along. And I've looked for other things. I've looked for like deep resilience of people who are born with it. But I honestly think that people who are surrounded by family, have them by their side uh, to go alongside them, seems to be one of the most important things. Um, and I, I know for you, you know, your, your kids at this point were still you know, teenagers. And I wondered how they played into that as well. First of all, um, Jennifer, when what was the conversation like with them, uh, when they, you know, A, Mike was back out of, he was out of his coma, but you knew that at some point there were going to be amputations. What were those conversations like, and how did the children handle that? They handled it very well. They had their grandmothers here. Yeah. We were getting a lasagna every half hour on our front porch. Mm -hmm. I think for yeah. them, it was a mix of pleasant times and some terrible thing that had happened they visited him. They, you know, they took it in stride. They handled it very well, I think. I remember initially, neither one of them wanted to come to the hospital that day that I called them with the social worker. Hmm. It, my younger son said, I'll wait till dad comes home. You know, I'll wait. Hmm. I'll see him when he comes home. Hmm. My older son called me back and he came in and sat with Mike on that, that day. Um, and he tells me that he felt a responsibility to take care of his younger brother. And I just don't remember much about that. I feel almost like I neglected them for a while because I was so focused on the day to day. Um, and because I knew they had help from, from family and friends. You're listening to Searching for Heroes. We'll be right back after this. The other side of that, though, is... You know, you're doing what you have to day by day to get through it. But sometimes, and I hear people say, well, you must sit down every day and have a really deep and emotional conversation. And I'm not certain that that helps either. You know, that there's, there's only a certain amount of that can do. I often think that if you do that again and again, that leads to a bad place. Because you know what? I think as Mike put it, you know, 
this is where we are. We're in it together. Let's just keep moving forward. Let's not sit and sort of put our arms around each other and say how bad it's all been. Let's look forward. And I, I think that's a big part of resilience as well, are those people who can adapt and don't want to spend too long just looking in each other's eyes and just, you know, uh, being all emotional about it. So I think that's perhaps another key to this. Uh, yeah, celebrate, Mike, do you think you remember? Every, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Jack. I remember Jack asking our older son, asking me, is dad going to die? And I, all I could say is, I don't know. This was when Mike was still in a coma. And I don't think he asked me again. I don't think mm. he asked me again. Mike, what were you going to say? I was going to say that I just remember that celebrating every little victory, little tiny victories. I was like, okay, you know, I, to me, that just, that was get up and keep, keep on going. Uh, hey, if I could, uh, walk two more steps on the walker, you know, than I did before. That was a victory that I, I was celebrating that, you know, that that's how I was looking at it because my goal all, all the time was to get back to as close to normal as I, I possibly could and work towards that every day and little victories along the way. Yes. Yeah. All for that. I think it's fair to say though, that none of these journeys are all positive and all go well. And, and I'm certain that there were some really difficult times for you as well. Um, w what were those like? They were, yeah, they were definitely, there were some difficult times, uh, uh, you know, uh, throughout the journey. You know, I, I remember a few of them distinctly and uh, they were tough. I mean, the amputation of my first leg, you know, they didn't, there was an issue with the uh, anesthesia. So when I came out of it, um, it was uh, pretty, pretty painful. And they had to rush in uh, the, uh, you know, the folks to give me some additional uh, anesthesia. But for, for about, I think it was honey, it was about 45 minutes. Um, I was in some serious, serious pain. And, uh, and I, I still remember that distinctly, you know, and, and, and dealing with that. Um, but, uh, luckily I have a short term memory. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you 45 minutes is a long time. Did you find at some point that, you know, when, 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 when things are painful for a few minutes, you know, you can just feel the pain, but after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you mentally have to try and go somewhere else and you have to try and get control over it. Did, did, you know, yes. I, I mean, that, that I, I had the same sort of thing, um, getting out of Ukraine, um, no pain meds, 10 hours on this train, bumping around. And I remember at some point I figured that I could try and put some of the pain to the side. I had to try and hold some of it down. I needed to be mentally strong. And, and, and I, to a certain degree, I felt I could. Right. And I was amazed, amazed at the mental strength and the ability that you have to sometimes be able to look that in the eye and, and, and try and find a way through it. Were you able to sort of think yes. about the pain as well? Yeah, I, I was um, focusing on controlling it um, and pushing it, you know, pushing it there, not thinking about it. And then it would come back and then I would take it and take it, hold of it and push it around to the other side and yeah. constantly doing that for an extended period of time. But it's amazing what you can do when you put your mind to it. It really is. Yeah. Do you think that you are a stronger person today do you do you think that you are a better i, mean, I, I don't know the word better but are you, do you feel that you have you've learned things through this that make you somehow a stronger person i would say yes i would say that i feel that way i feel that i've gone through an experience that was uh tough very tough but illuminating to understanding my own strengths mm. and and now that I, nothing really kind of bothers me that much anymore, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> After this. Yeah, I feel that. Jennifer, you must have also had to find your own strength. And I wonder sometimes if, did you sometimes feel that there was so much attention on Mike when you were doing so much as well? Um, did, did that ever cross your mind to a certain degree? And I feel in mean, my family as well, I keep reminding people that my wife has gone through as much as I've gone through. And we must always talk about my wife and how she's, how strong she is. But sometimes they just want to talk about my injuries because I seem to be the focus. Did you ever find that? Not really. 
Um, honey, you've always been a burden. So. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> we still joke about things like when we go somewhere and there's no parking, we have handicap plates now. And mm. we'll we'll grab a spot and we always look at each other. What do we say? Totally worth it. Yeah, that's so funny. I say the same thing to my wife and my kids all the time about the parking. And isn't this great? Silver linings. Silver linings. Oh damn. Um but Jennifer, for you as well, life is totally different now. I mean, it's fair to say that. And again, have, how have you just embraced that? And which parts have been sort of most difficult? I still am afraid that something bad will happen. Mm. I can't shake that feeling. Not even necessarily to my, maybe to one of our kids. I'm just try not to project it too much, but I'm, I'm, always terrified that something's going to happen yeah. and then long term we'll retire together you know what's that going to be like we, we still like to travel it's difficult to travel when you need a special shower yeah. so it's just more stuff that we'll figure out as we as we go forward but also some worry and some concern and a little bit of fear yeah um Mike, what, um, so I, I, so I, I know what, you know, losing legs are like, but I mean, fingers seems to be perhaps even harder yeah. to some degree. And I wonder if you could talk about how the loss of your fingers impacts what you can do, what you can't do, what life is like. Yeah. I mean, definitely a lot of adapting going on there. I can tell you that. Um, I, you know, I, uh, I always, I joke with some of the, you know, when my, my fingers were amputated, I still had a, you know, a few, few parts left right on the, on the fingers. And I was, I was telling everybody that, you know, um, you know, I still have, I still have opposable thumbs. So I'm part of, the, I'm part of the race still, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, just adapting to utilizing these things. Yeah, it, it, it can. It's it's uh, it's difficult. I mean, certain things. There's a lot of power in the in your fingers at the end of your fingers. I don't have that anymore, so I have to think of alternate ways, like open a jar, uh, to uh, you know pick something off the floor. I don't have that pincer movement. It, there's there's a lot of things like that that you have to that you have to accommodate, um, and so. Yeah. And then you're just putting on my prosthetic legs, for instance, right? Um, or changing the shoes on my prosthetic legs when I don't have fingers. You have to come up with certain other techniques to do that. It's not it's not as simple because you don't have the fingers to pull the shoes off and, and everything like that. So but there's always there's always a way. You always figure out something. Yeah. Well, can I ask what do you uh how many how much of your fingers do you have left and what are you able to let me show you. So on my on this one, I just have the thumb. Yeah. Right. And and on this one, let's see if I can get that right. Uh, you see, I've got I've I've got my thumb sort of, and then let me see if I can show it. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So I still have part of it, but so you know, there's some there's some things I can do, but you can't get that pincer movement, right? And you can't. So it's it's uh, it's that's the challenge. Yeah. But I am going to look to see, now that I got through the whole kidney situation, I'm going to look at putting, getting, there are some, some different types of um, prosthetics that you can get that even some of them don't even require surgery. So I'm, I'm looking to do, look at, that's the next step. That's, that's where I'm going to go forward, figure out, like, get some more uh, mechanics going. Yeah, that's it. Keep looking forward. You've actually got to. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we might finish up with both of you sort of each telling me, I think what you really think people should learn, like uh, not just about, you know, what happened to you, but also about if they're going through things that are difficult as well, like what you have learned that allowed you guys to just keep moving, bounce back and sort of just continue in your relationship almost as, as if nothing changed. It's resiliency. It's, it's being it, but it's also, uh, you know, consciously picking that, that choice to go forward being optimistic about it. Yeah. You are going to have hard times and they're going to keep, that's part of life. You're, you're part of being a human, right? But 
you, you can, you can take that and take those challenges and keep marching forward. And that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah. This was a tough one, but don't, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it was easy, but, uh, throughout it, I was, I had a, I, I believe I was optimistic and, and forward thinking that I will overcome this and I will keep on going forward. And I feel that way today, just working through it, you know, yeah. and don't, don't get depressed, you know, I'm still here. You know, they gave me a 1% chance to live. Eh, I'll take those. I'll take those odds any day. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Jennifer, how about you? I didn't realize the extent to which we had a support network around us until we needed it. The friends, the family for four months, there were people who took care of us every day. Um, my boss at work, accommodated my need to dial into conference calls from the hospital cafeteria. It, it, you don't realize how much your friends and family and your work family can be a resource or how much they care. I mean, why would you know unless something like this happens? But it's it's there. It's there. Neighbors. Yeah. Just remarkable. Yeah. I share absolutely all of those feelings. I really do. And I'm very lucky to have seen it myself. And I just think that, you know, you should pass that round because you never know when you'll need it yourself. And uh, that's what being a community is about. Uh, Mike, Jennifer, I can't thank you enough for joining me uh, today. I can't thank you enough for reaching out, Jennifer. I'm really pleased you did. And it was, it was a pleasure meeting you and talking with you. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, both of you. What a pleasure. We both. Take care saw what happened with you and yeah. realized how lucky Mike was to have been at home when he mm. got sick. Whereas, you know, how far away you were and all you went through, we, we felt really felt for you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I felt all those feelings as well, but just like you were saying, you know, you feel them when, when they're coming your way and you're so grateful for them. So uh, I guess uh, we all share that uh, you guys and I, we share that. Have a wonderful day, both of you. What a pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you. We'll be back in a moment with Searching for Heroes. Well, it really is amazing to watch the two of them uh, be a couple together. Much as, and I'm certain, in almost exactly the same way they were a couple before uh, the sepsis hit Mike. Look, and I think about my relationship with my own wife, Alicia, and how it has changed in many ways because Alicia has to be there to, to help when need help and she's kept our family going. But in many ways, it's just the same. The, the relationship, the love we had is exactly the same. And the same is true when you listen to Mike and Jennifer just there. And that, as we've said in so many of our podcasts, I think that is probably where the most resilience comes from. They talk about their communities again, people they worked with, people who live near them, the doctors, all of them, they're working together. And if you can't listen to a story like that and just realize that that's what makes our country so great, um, then you're reading from the wrong story. So, look, thanks so much for listening today. And just remember to hold those you love close, because when you need help, they'll be there for you. Anyway, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.